<laughs> it's just li Pablo is not listening to me. <laughs> That's great. Now I think I'll hand the mic over to uh, to Florian Westfall. Uh, as you know, he's already been mentioned by by Harold. He's kind of kind of famous famous Colonel guy. So uh, here you go. Thank you. So let's start. So first, I'm go um, giving a brief overview of what Art Netlink is and what it's doing and why we have this thing. <coughs> then I will delve into what RT Netlink used to look like and uh, what it looks like now and what kind of problems we have with it. And then I will talk about the kind of problems and challenges, challenges we are currently facing when trying to push down the RTNL log to make this thing more scalable. So basically, um, RT Netlink is the kernel's interface to user space to configure all things networking. And that's pretty ancient by kernel standards. It was added more than 20 years ago. And um, basically, you can't even build a kernel without RT Netlink unless you um, elide all, kind, uh, all, 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 all the entire network stack completely. And so if you configure an IPv4 address or IPv6 address or you bring up and down tunnels, then you always involve RT Netlink at one point. And in the kernel, there is a register API where um, a user uh, kernel module can basically say for this protocol family and this type, for instance, new route, invoke this callback. And um, in Linux uh, 4.13, the kernel stack basically looks like this. Whenever uh, an RT Netlink message is coming in and we first grab the RTNL lock, then the message is uh, processed and after that we unlock again. And all that uh, RT Netlink receive message uh, does is basically it, it um, takes a look at the R RT Netlink message, which contains the family and the type, and then finds out what callback it needs to invoke, invokes that callback, and after that it's done. And uh, it's up to the callback to decode what the actual message is supposed to do. For instance, is this message supposed to um, delete an IP address, for, for example, and if yes, which one, and so on and so forth. Um, RT Netlink Mutex, what does it do actually? So first of all, as we have seen, it serializes really all the RT Netlink requests. It does not matter what they do, they all have to go through the single request. Then it serializes with other user space APIs that somehow interact with um, the uh, Netlink uh, system. For instance, there is a sysfs file which you can change to um, change the name alias of a network interface and that is even though it's exposed via SysFS, it's also ex available via RT Netlink. So whenever someone changes that, the SysFS code that is responsible for this also grabs the RTNL mutex. And another very um, popular data structure in the kernel that is used, um, that is protected via the RTNL mutex is the list of network namespaces. So whenever some piece of kernel code has to make changes that affect all network namespaces and it has to iterate the network namespace list. This has to be done under RTNL mutex protection as well. And as a consequence of that, um, you can only do one request at a time. So when you, for instance, want to add a new IP address and someone else is listing all um, links in a system or um, some other program is dumping a list of um, traffic control um, classifiers attached to the system, then um, those all have to wait until the first action is done. And um, dump requests, even though they technically don't change anything in the system, they are also uh, fully serialized by this RTNL mutex. And a consequence of that is that the RTNL mutex can be hold for a very long time. So for instance, the, uh, the do-it callback might sleep for a brief moment because it has to wait for a kernel memory allocation to complete. There are more expensive operations like synchronized net, net which um, could cause this thing to wait for a couple of milliseconds. And if you are looking for high numbers, le uh, for instance, consider a routing daemon that wants to insert tens of thousands of routes, then this um, single mutex becomes a real pain point, especially if you also consider 
other users that, for instance, want to look at statistics and traffic count uh, and, and uh, TC. So um, what we would like to do is basically get rid of this um, single serialization step and make it so that different actions can happen in parallel. But unfortunately, most of the DoWit callbacks make assumptions on RTNL mutex being held and protecting us from certain things. So for instance, um, the RTNL lock obviously guarantees full cons consistency within a handler. So if you um, check a property of, say, uh, um, a network link inside a handler, and then later make the same check again in the handler, then it's obviously n not going to change, because if it would have uh, to be changed, then someone else would have to grab this mutex, which they can't obviously do, because you are owning it already. So what we decided to do is um, we are now allowing in this register API, we are allowing to say that if this message type is requested, then we allow to say that it can be called without a mutex. So what's ha happening now in Linux 4.14, this mutex, which was here normally, it's no longer there, and instead in this function, there is now a check if you have decoded the type and the uh, function that you want to invoke, check if the uh, in-kernel user has basically um, flagged this callback as it can run lockless. And if so, then the lockless version is used, and if not, then the old one is used. At this time, most of the uh, kernel will still use this fallback pass and do full serialization of um, RTNL. There were some low-hanging fruits that are already um, converted. So for instance, RTM get route, which is basically uh, just an interface to user space where user space can ask the kernel um, which um, network interface uh, packet would take if you give it the routing keys, for instance, IP addresses or uh, device information. And then the kernel will say, I don't have a route for this, or it will go via this interface and things like that. Um, other things that should be easy to convert or have been converted are handlers that use a different lock internally. So one example would be IPv6 address labels, because nothing in that functionality really needed the RTN mutex to begin with, and the um, address label database in the kernel already had a, a private lock for this. So we could um, easily change that. The main problem is that even if a handler doesn't modify anything, then um, the RTNL mutex still uh, guarantees consistency. For instance, you know that the device in question will not silently go away underneath because you are holding the RTNL mutex. You know that the name is not going to change. Uh, it's not going to be switched to a different network namespaces and all of that. There are also various um, um, callbacks that the kernel has to deal with, for instance, uh, network interfaces being added or removed. And all of those also depend on the RTNL mutex. So for instance, if a driver is unloaded, say, say you're, you are someone unloads the module um, that implements GRE tunnels, then nothing bad will happen because all of this will be serialized by the RTNL mutex as well. And then we have the um, complex cases with virtual interfaces and stacked setups like bonding or bridge where you have multiple interfaces on top of another. And uh, you obviously don't want bad things to happen just because someone else removed uh, a stack device while you try to look at it. it so, um, another example would be the function RTNL fill IF info, which is used uh, pretty frequently in most of the dumpers. And what it does, it basically uh, just marshals all the information in the kernel into your user space format, for instance, um, the device name, the, the transmit queue length, and so on and so forth. And we don't take any special precautions against changing information because we hold this mutex. So you don't have to worry about the name being inconsistent and the user seeing something that is um, a mixture between the old and the new name when it gets renamed. And uh, really, if you want to get rid of the RTNL mutex, we have to find solutions on how we can guarantee consist consistency even when we don't have the mutex anymore. One thing that was very easy to convert is the AFOPS. Basically, the RTNL AFOPS contain 
family specific information uh, um, operations, for instance, uh, IPv4 and IPv6. So there are not many of these in the kernel because we don't have that many address families in the kernel to begin with. So it was easy to audit all of that and since uh, not a single callback needs to sleep, we can just protect this with RCU and are done with it. The more difficult one are the RTNL link ops, which implements um, in the kernel, the part that is responsible, for instance, to bring up a new network link. So if you configure a tunnel or t tear down a bridge, um, then a special RTNL link op will be called for that implements the actual logic in the driver. And um, obviously, if we don't have RTNL mutex for that anymore, then we need to find a way to uh, be sure that nothing bad can happen when someone unloads the driver because we don't want another CPU to still call into that driver while it's being unloaded. But fortunately, it turned out that it's already safe at this point because um, as long as the callback either acquires mutex, we are safe, but we are also safe if the callback takes the RCU read lock while it's um, using or making calls into the RTNL link ops. And we are also safe when we increment the device reference count the reason for that is because if a driver is removed and the link ops are being unregistered, then the, the kernel will have to wait until all the devices that are affected by this are being removed. And this removal happens when RTNL mutex is unlocked and the device ref count must drop to zero for that. So as long as we um, keep a device reference count, we are also safe. So general problems when converting this. So the worst part is basically that we are talking about a huge amount of code. And uh, most of this stuff involves NetF operations and those bring the entire device drivers into the game. So you really can't just look at the core code, but you would have to also audit every single network driver. So a typical question would be, for instance, can I, uh, can when someone adds uh, offloads for FDB, can that work without RTNL mutex? Then you would have to audit every single driver. Does it use a pr does it have a private lock? Yes or no? And if no, then I would have to add one. So this quickly gets out of hand. And the same question can re basically repeat it for every single other NDO op or a function that somehow interacts with uh, device drivers. And then, as mentioned, we are not just dealing with data races. We are also dealing with trivial, or seemingly trivial things like parallel module removals. Um, one request moving a, uh, a network link to a different namespace and uh, things like that. And uh, even worse are net device notifiers as we are about to find out. So I will now give two examples of subsystems where I tried to remove the RTNL mutex because I at, first, at first I thought that it would be quite straightforward, but in both cases it turned out to be quite problematic. And the first one is DevINet and the other one is FIB. So let's first look at DefiNet. DefiNet basically just um, implements IP address management. Um, so IP addresses and things like that. It also has a legacy IO control based interface, which also is serialized by the RTNL mutex. So everything gets serialized, no matter if you have, uh, if you're using old um, net tools like Netstat or uh, the old route binary or the new IP tools it's always RT Netlink. So um, one problem is that when a new address is added to the system, then it, it's not just that the kernel just does that, but it not only validates the address, but then it invokes an, the network device notifier chain. And that in turn um, makes calls into drivers. For instance, IPv LAN, will listen to um, new addresses that are supposed to be configured and it can in fact veto and say no I cannot accept this new configuration that you want to add and in that case the request to add this new address would fail. So obviously you need to serialize that in some way because um, otherwise you could never be sure that the address that's being added could in fact generate a conflict with IPVLAN if you can't guarantee that the state remains consistent while you are doing all these checks. And um, that's quite a big problem and 
similar problems exist in FIB. Again, FIB is also serialized by this RTNL mutex. I thought that it would be quite easy because the FIB is mostly used from the packet path and in the packet path you can't take any mutexes because they sleep, so the entire read-only thing making lookups in the FIB is guaranteed to be lockless. So I thought we could just basically remove the RTNL mutex and create a new private mutex for the FIB. But it's not that easy because changes to the FIB can also incur indirectly by the kernel itself and not just on behalf of user space. And um, it's not easy to use both a new mutex and the RTNL mutex at the same time because whenever you have more than one lock involved then you always risk deadlocks. So you will have to keep very strict ordering on which lock is allowed to be taken first if you allow this. So the problem is that all the network device notifiers are called with the RTNL mutex already held. So if we now allow changes to happen from the network device notifiers, then we would ta have to take the private lock, which means that the private lock is taken after the RTNL mutex. And once we allow that, we cannot allow the reverse, obviously, because it would result in a deadlock. So the second issue is the dumb consistency check. And the problem is basically that a netlink dump can be very, very large. Bec just consider a system that has maybe a lot of um, a, a large um, TC hierarchy with lots of classes and someone dumps that and you will get a lot of information that has, been, uh, has to be brought to user space and it might not even fit in the single message. And the way that is solved is that the dump request is allowed to span multiple messages. But um, once you do that, you have to release the lock, obviously, before you return to user space. So there is uh, a small window where changes can come in while a dump is happening. And you need some way to for the kernel and or, uh, to notify user space that the dump is possibly inconsistent because uh, some other changed changes happened in between. So the way that this is done usually is that you have some sort of counter that is incremented whenever a change happens. And when you start a dump, you just look at this counter value. And after the dump is completed, you will check if the counter has been changed. And if it was changed, then the kernel knows that something might be missing in the messages because we had to skip it because uh, some data structure was inconsistent. And we tell user space about that by setting a flag in the dump message. But the problem is that <coughs> if, we had, uh, if we now um, change counters that before were only changed under this RTNL mutex, if we make it, for instance, atomic to allow it to change in parallel, then we can get still get situations where we might miss the fact that the, the dump was inconsistent even though it appears to not be so. For instance, consider two tasks, A and B. A adds a new FIP entry and B um, makes a dump request of the FIP database. It can happen that the FIP entry is linked into the list and only then, when the dump has already finished, we make the modification to the counter. This problem can't happen at the moment because the dumps and the changes can't occur in parallel in the first place because they are both serialized by the RTNL mutex. So the only way we could possibly allow both to happen at the same time if we find a way to make these counters both atomic and allow at the same time to detect when a modification is happening right now. So the only possible way out would be to somehow use sequence locks for this so that we know just from looking at the counter value if it's even or odd whether a change is happening right now and then we could possibly block, either block the dump or just signal it as inconsistent. Um, the last thing that is not so easy is um, lockless dumps, which is very tempting because there is really no uh, logical reason why we could should not be able to, say, uh, look at the FIP database while uh, someone else wants to um, configure a QDisk, for instance. So it would be very nice to allow both in parallel so, so that at least um, 
dumps which don't change any state can occur while a modification is happening. This was already tried a few years back and it had to be reverted again because there's just too much code that makes um, these consistency um, assumptions. So I started to have some patches accepted in the kernel already that reduce the, st uh, reduce the spots where we make these assumptions about consistency, but it's not done yet. So for instance, we currently would crash if another CPU replaces the QDisk when a dump is in progress simply because there is uh, no reference count that would prevent it from happening. And then there are, for instance, um, if you dump, then user space will get information about the XDP program that might be attached to the interface, and there's nothing that would prevent bad things from happening if we don't take the RGNL mutex at that point. Other things are SIOV information, link stats, and uh, stack devices. So uh, in summary, you could s basically say that the network config pass has a gazillion of dependencies, um, especially the network notifiers, which are not very obvious, so it's not really enough to just look at the code. And that makes it really hard to remove RTNL locking. The initial infrastructure is there, because we can now basically annotate the handlers and uh, make them lockless. But to actually get most of the really important handlers to a point where we don't need the mutex anymore. It's going to, it's going to be a long road ahead. Um, currently fo I'm focusing on seeing whether we can make the um, dumps lockless again <coughs> by removing the spots that make RTNL mutex assumptions. Any questions? Otherwise, please find me later. Um, what about the part that, at least as far as I'm concerned, hurts most is the uh, network namespaces. Uh, when you call a cleanup net, it can take hundreds of milliseconds if you get even two, three uh, net network namespaces to clean up. And then if you restart the application and uh, cl a cleanup net holds the RTNL mutex, and let's say you just do a syscontrol to set IPv6 parameters, uh, at least if in no, not in x86, but with ARM, you get into a deadlock. Because in, uh, what happens is the sys control returns busy, and in ARM, if, if, a, if a system calls get busy, it from the sys con uh, system call handler re retries automatically without going back to user space. So you get into a deadlock. And uh, I think this part hurts the most. I mean, th the only way around it is to, to reset the board. In the upcoming kernel 4.15, I divided by 10 the time to dismantle NetNS, so should be good for you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> So, so um, we kind of make this problem worse in wireless because we hold the RTNL all the time. And I'm, I'm thinking about how can we fix this because the only reason we really want to hold it is that we need to make sure that our net devs don't go away and we're sort of synchronized against all these notifiers that tell us your net dev just went away because we rely heavily on the stack interacting there and the stack saying, all right, um, or I mean the net dev stack telling the Wi-Fi stack, right, this net dev is going down or something and we need to interact with that and we can't really have any other operations going on at the same time. So um, is, there, is there anything that you've done with respect to like splitting out certain things like the dev list? I mean, I know there's a dev list mutex also, um, but it, it doesn't really seem to be used very much uh, or in, in common usage. So is there anything that you've done in, in that area where we could say, all right, let's just take the dev list mutex where we need to, and then uh, we can rely on all these other things or on, on the serialization there? Um, no, I looked at it. I thought, okay, I can never get that done, and quickly moved to other tasks I thought were simpler, and um, then that, and I found out about the net device notifiers, and yeah. So I'm just looking at, um, at the moment I'm pretty much just looking at uh, making dumps lockless again, or at okay. least per family, lo uh, locked per family. Fair enough. All right, I think for Wi-Fi at least the dumps hopefully are lockless, or it could be made, but 
But yeah, we we hold. I mean, you mentioned we hold the RTNL over a synchronized net or something like that, right? I mean, we hold the RTNL over sending commands to the devices, and those might be on a USB bus. That's not really not what you want to do, but um, it's difficult to solve that because we you know can't just have the net dev go away while we do something with it. And we can hold it, but then we need to look it up, and we need we have all these quirks where we have a bunch of net devs, right? So we don't really want any one of them to go away. So we don't want to hold all of them, and you it, it gets tricky. But yeah, if there's nothing there, we'll just maybe I look at it, but I won't promise anything. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Don't promise anything. Yeah, you spoke about the, um, the notifiers. Uh, so with this potential potential dead lock, if you are using two metex. Uh, uh, so one idea would be eventually to use a uh, asynchronous uh, notifier, being able to post a notifier and to run it later in a different context, eventually from another process, if needed. Yes, it does not help for IPv LAN. You have this veto issue again, right? You need the notifier to do something, and you need all of the notifiers to return. All right, this operation is fine. Not all of them need to be synchronous, but there are a lot of them that need to be synchronous. Like, can I bring this interface up? And Qtis code, yeah, sorry. We have this uh, recent fix from Kong, Wong about uh, adding a synchronous call RCU barrier and synchronous uh, synchronize RCU in QDisk uh, management code. And that's awful, because if you hold RTNL, then uh, you wait like sometime 50 milliseconds just to do the synchronized RCU. Yeah, so 300. So basically, I think I do think that all the QDisk code should be not relying on RTNL at all, but use uh, another Metex. So if the QDIS code needs to send a notifier, I'm pretty sure that we don't need synchronous uh, stuff for QDIS. QDIS is like, a, well, it should be completely different space. I don't see any point for that. So any more questions? No, let's, let's, let's thank uh, Florian for doing this uh, huge effort.